Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation. We're going to introduce the Flink SQL Connector for Pulsar, which is also known as the Pulsar SQL Connector. I will first talk about how to use the Pulsar SQL Connector, and then we'll talk about another important component called the Pulsar Catalog. And we'll run a quick demo of everything we will be talking about today. And lastly, we'll provide you with some resources and the roadmaps about Pulsar SQL Connector. Uh, before we dive right into our topics today, I want to do a quick introduction of myself. And my name is Yufei Zhang, and you can call me Effie as well. I'm a stream native engineer working with Flink and Pulsar. On the right side is a picture of my lovely cat called Bowsy. And you might be wondering what is stream native. Well, we're a company building a cloud native event streaming platform based on Pulsar. And our vision is to provide enterprises to have easy access um, to a real-time event streams. Well, I think that's pretty much about uh, me and my company. Let's get started. Our first question will be, uh, what is a Pulsar SQL Connector? Well, as we all know, that the Flink has two APIs. The first is called the Data Stream API, where users write uh, Java or Scala code, probably in an IDE, and then we'll package them into a jar with all the dependencies. And lastly, we uh, submit this jar onto a Flink cluster. The second API, SQL and the Table API, allows users to write simple uh, SQL queries to express complicated Flink jobs. Well, uh, once we've understand these two concepts, that's where the Pulsar SQL connector comes in. Well, the Pulsar SQL connector allows Flink SQL jobs to be connected to Pulsar clusters and reading from or writing into Pulsar topics. Uh, we need to know that the Pulsar SQL connector is built on top of the Pulsar data stream connector. There is another awesome presentation about the Pulsar data stream connector as well. So feel free to check it out. And the Pulsar data stream connector is actually uh, the runtime implementation of the operator and is responsible for the actual data reading and writing jobs. And the last part is uh, we mentioned earlier is the Pulsar catalog. Uh, what is the Pulsar catalog? Uh, for now, we can just understand it as a, a metadata storage for uh, Flink tables uh, using Pulsar. Well, the next question would naturally be, uh, why do we need the Pulsar SQL connector? The reason is obvious, uh, because Flink SQL is becoming more and more popular within the community. Uh, but why is, 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 is it becoming more popular? I think the reasons are two or three, uh, because uh, the SQL are very uh, easy to use for those SQL only users, such as BI teams who only want to uh, write a Flink job to do some um, simple transformations without uh, learning Java or Scala. And the second part is the reason is uh, it's uh, useful for running ad hoc queries against Pulsar topics. Uh, for example, you want to read from a Pulsar topic and do some simple uh, transformations and write back to a Pulsar topic using Flink. If you're using the data stream API, you have to st start a project from scratch and manage the dependencies, manage the packaging pipelines, and then upload it to um, a uh, Flink cluster. However, with the help of Pulsar SQL connector and the Flink SQL, you can simply write a single query to express and submit using the Flink SQL uh, uh, client. And the last uh, reason is for change data capture scenarios. Uh, we won't be focusing on CTC case use case here, but it's very definitely very useful to uh, learn more about the CTC use cases with Flink SQL. Okay, so in short, uh, the Flink uh, Pulsar SQL connector provides a seamless integration between the Flink and Pulsar, and it completes the entire ecosystem. And that's why we would want the Pulsar SQL connector. Okay, next we're going to look at how to use the Pulsar SQL Connector. First, begin by the installation part. Well, for SQL client, you need to download the Flink SQL Connector Pulsar jar, and then you need to make sure it's on the class pass when you're starting the SQL client, such as like, like appointing uh, the jar location while you are, when you are starting the SQL client. And if you're using the table API, you need to add the, the connector jar to your dependencies, either in a pom.xml or a Gradle file. Uh, we, throughout this session, we will be using SQL client and a preview flink image with all the dependencies installed. Okay, good. 
Let's now look at a simple example here. As you can see, we're creating a table uh, called SQL underscore user. And as you can see, there are six columns. The last column, row underscore time, is a computed column. And the other five are physical columns. And it tells the Flink SQL to uh, read these columns from postal messages. That's a column definitions. And the next part is the watermark strategy. And it defines a watermark on the row time. And it's a five seconds watermark. And the last part is a connector configs. As you can see here, the connector is to pulsar in case this is a pulsar connector. And the topics is the topic or multiple topics that you want to subscribe to. Either you want to read from it or you want to write into it. Admin URL, service URL, these are pulsar connection related configs. It allows you to have network connection to the pulsar instances. And the last config is a bit more interesting. It's the format. Uh, what we need to know about the format now is that the format uh, allows the Flink SQL jobs to know how to map those uh, binary data stored in a pulsar topic into the columns we defined, such as name, age, income, single, and create time. Here, we're using the format of JSON, which means that we're expecting the binary format are in the JSON format. Cool. Uh, since this is a basic definition, and there are some other more advanced uh, definitions as well, such as a metadata column, as you can see here, there's an event time declared as metadata, and there's a message set declared uh, declare as metadata. Uh, what is a metadata column? Oh, before that, we want to first introduce uh, what is the pulsar message metadata. Uh, the in fact that uh, every pulsar message is associated with the metadata, such as the topic it, it belongs to, the producer name that actually produced this message, and the publish time, event time of this message, and the message size of the message. Those are called the metadata of the pulsar message, and the metadata column within Flink SQL context. It allows users to declare columns that should be mapped from the pulsar message and metadata instead of a message body. So here, as you can see the event time, it says, okay, it's from the metadata instead of the message body. Another thing you might have noticed is a virtual keyword. So what does a virtual keyword mean? A virtual keyword means that, okay, this metadata column is only available at the source. Meaning when you are reading from it, it's visible and it's present in the Flink record. But when you are writing from a Flink job to a uh, possible topic, this column will be ignored because for such as uh, for properties such as a message size, it's decided by the whatever the payload is, and you, you cannot set it to any custom value. And on the right side is a table of all the available um metadata keys you can use within the Pulsar SQL connector. As you can see here, only the event time is uh, both readable and writable, and the all others are just only readable at the source. Okay, now we have finished the basic um, use cases on how to define columns. The next question will be, how does the Flink node to map the data into the columns? Well, as we mentioned earlier, this comes to the realm of uh, the Flink format. And uh, before we go right into the Flink format, we want to have a little bit of background information about uh, something called pulsar schema. Uh, what is a pulsar schema? Well, that a, a pulsar schema allows each topic to have an optional schema and describing how to serialize and deserialize pulsar messages. Uh, so the pulsar producers and the pulsar consumers API can use a pulsar schema to like manage all the serialization and deserialization works. However, this is not an, always necessary because you can always store the messages as pure bytes and you can manage your serial, serialization or deserialization in your user code. So what are the available positive schemas? There are structured schemas such as Avril, JSON, and Protobuf, Protobuf native. And there are primitive types such as integers, doubles, Boolean. That's all the available uh, positive schemas. And then next, we're going to talk about the Flink format. What does the Flink format do? As we said earlier, the Flink format defines how to map binary data onto the table columns. There are some existing ones built by the Flink community, such as Avro, JSON, CSV, and RAW, which is used for primitive types. And these, all these Flink formats actually assumes the binary data it's going to read are in expected format. Well, 
once we know what is a part of schema and fling format, we will want to know uh, how do we uh, choose the right fling format for each part of schema. Well, there are two cases. The first case is that when the target part of topic is actually has a valid schema, such as Avro JSON, and it's using the schema to store the data. In this case, we would face a question, how to choose the right format to use. Well, the instinct is very simple. You can just for Avro use Avro, for JSON use JSON, right? But in fact, there are very two different frameworks and it's used by two different systems. And we want to make sure that the Flink formats can actually understand the binary data produced within process schema. How do we guarantee that? Well, they follow the same pro binary format protocol, right? They both see, follow the JSON protocol, they follow the Avro protocol. So in theory, they should work and work very well together, right? But when we're in real life, it's not always the case because there might be tiny differences and due to implementation details or a different version of uh, Avro. There are, you know, you never know if they can work together very well unless you really test them thoroughly. So what are the solutions here? So there are basically two solutions. Uh, the ideal solution would be, or you, okay, we implement a Flink format for each of these the schemas. For each, for example, for Pulsar Avro, we need to implement a Flink format called the Pulsar Avro format, and it matches all the internal, uh, it uh, has all the internal uh, tricky parts about the Pulsar Avro implementation. But this is not available yet, so we will have to come back to the, or the original solution that, okay, we trust that the Flink format and the Pulsar schema follows the same protocol, which is the Avro and JSON, and we want to test thoroughly to make sure that uh, these two works together. So the result seems pretty cool uh, because after some testing, um, we actually know that Avro and JSON and Rule actually works pretty well with the Pulsar schema system. However, as you can see on the right side table, uh, some Pulsar schemas does not have the corresponding format to use yet. And the available ones are the Avro, JSON, and some primitive types at this moment. Okay, this is when this is when you are actually using the process schema on the on your topics, but you can actually just not use a process schema, and you let the process topics to store pure bytes, and you let the Flink SQL jobs to take over all the jobs of serialization works, and because you are the Flink formats and the Flink jobs are the only consumers and producers of the Pulsar topic, you can basically use whatever formats you want to use, whether it's CSV, JSON, or Avril, or any other formats. Uh, it's like you are managing your uh, serialization framework in the user code. So it's like the graph described below, the Flink job A reads from some data system, and it's writing to a Pulsar topic using CSV, and the CSV is not a like a, any Pulsar schema, right? And you have another Flink job B, reading from the same topic using the CSV format and read to back to a data system too. In this case, you, because as long as you, you use a compatible Flink formats, uh, whatever format you use is okay. So to sum up on the format uh, choice, so if you wish to use Pulsar schema with the Flink SQL, uh, you have to choose the right and a compatible format to use based on the table we saw earlier. And if you do not use the Pulsar schema and you just want Flink SQL to take over everything, then any Flink format will be good. And as you can see here, uh, there is a lot of um, Pulsar schemas that does not have a corresponding Flink formats. Uh, what's the plan? Well, we are working on to providing those custom uh, Pulsar specific Flink formats at this time. Okay, uh, we pretty much covered uh, a lot of details on the Pulsar SQL connector now. And next we're going to talk about another important concept called the Pulsar catalog. Uh, we talked a bit about the Pulsar catalog earlier, that it's a metadata storage uh, for the Flink SQL, and it's used to store the table definition. Well, that's true, uh, because by default, the Flink uh, SQL uses a generic in-memory catalog, which is basically when you are creating a table, after you create a table, uh, create a UDF, create a view, and everything is persists only in the memory. And if you restart the Flink, everything you created earlier will be lost. So that's not desirable, right? Um, that's how why we use a pulsar as a metadata storage for to persist those table definitions, and we do not need any other components. We just need Flink and pulsar. Uh, 
And since we are using positive signal connector, there is, there is no extra burdens at all. However, as of today, the posture catalog does not support views, UDF yet it only supports persistent table definitions. The way to create a posture catalog is very simple. You need to execute a create a catalog statement in the SQL client, and they provide some a connection config, and a posture catalog will be created. Within the posture catalog context, we actually define two kinds of table. The first one is called explicit table. These tables are defined as created using created table statements. Like this is the most common use case as if you were not using any um, posit catalog at all. It's like if you are using uh, creating tables in any other SQL connectors. The only difference you can make sure is that the table schema definition will be persisted in the posit cluster. And you can use uh, all the um, functionalities of create table statements such as defining watermarks, defining primary keys, and defining metadata columns. Another table, a native table, is more interesting. As its name suggests, it's mapped directly from existing poster topics. Well, for such kind of table, you do not need any create table statements, and then you can start a query uh, using the topic name as a table name. This kind of use case is um, useful for simple queries, for ad hoc queries, and you don't want the complicated uh, watermark strategies. You just want to, to see what if the data is fl flowing out from the topics. However, this comes with limitations as well because it's, it's automatically created by the poster catalog. You cannot specify watermarks, metadata, or key primary keys on such kind of table. And because you cannot define watermarks, uh, you cannot do window aggregations as well. But don't worry. Uh, because you can create multiple tables against a topic, so a native table will not be conflict with the explicit table. You can still create multiple ex explicit tables against uh, uh, the same topic. Well, let's take a closer look at the explicit table uh, and it's in how it's persisted. In fact, it's pretty simple. Uh, for each table you created using create table statements, the poster catalog will create a placeholder topic under a system tenant and uh, there's no data flowing in this placeholder topic. The only part we want to use about the placeholder topic is its schema definition. As uh, its name suggests, we will store the flink table schema um, uh, in the placeholder topics poster schema definition. On the right side is a picture of the uh, poster schema definition of the placeholder topic. And as you can see, there is some uh, Flink schema related field. To use an explicit table, it's quite simple. You first create a catalog, you create a database, and then use that database, and then you create a table. It's very simple, just like any other SQL connectors. And this is a graph describing the re relationships between the topics and the tables. For example, if you create a table named SQL underscore user, and we set it to map to a topic named the user. And within the sample slash flink name space, this, uh, there is a user topic, and this is where all the data will be flowing in and out. However, there is another placeholder topic under a system tenant called uh, underscore underscore flink underscore catalog slash SQL underscore examples. And there is a placeholder topic called table underscore SQL underscore user. All the metadata will be read from the placeholder topic instead of the uh, real uh, mapped uh, data topic. And for native tables, things are a little bit different because we map a pulsar uh, tenant and namespace combination to a Flink database. And so you can expect uh, a, a topic name with public default uh, topic A to be available under a database named as public slash default. And the topic name will be the same as the table name, which is topic A in our case. The parser catalog derives the columns of the table schema from the parser schema of the target topic. And also a parser catalog will decide the format for this table to use automatically as well. In fact, for structured parser schemas, uh, the corresponding flink format will be either ever or JSON, and the columns will be derived from the poster schema. And for primitive types, since there is 
no fields names in the schema. So we'll, it, this kind of uh, topics will be mapped to a single column table with a field name called value. Uh, native tables have limitations as well um, because uh, as you can see, it will translate a parser schema into a fling table schema. So it requires a parser topic to use a valid uh, schema, meaning that the uh, topic, this parser schema should match whatever the data stored in the topic. And as we talked about earlier, some parser schemas do not have a corresponding fling format. So this auto uh, schema to format mapping is not supported for some of the parser schemas. To use a native table, as you can see here, still you create a catalog and you do not need to create a new database. You just use an existing database mapped from a parser uh, tenant namespace combination. And then you can start to query from the uh, table or, or in fact, it's a topic uh, directly. You do not need any create statements. Uh, this pretty much concludes everything about um, parser catalog. And we will do a demo about everything we covered today. Uh, please, please notice that all the code will be available in this stream native slash Flink example repository. It uh, contains not only SQL examples, but also uh, data stream examples as well. So feel free to check it out. We're now inside this Flink example repository. Our first thing uh, needs to do is to create a running Pulsar instance and uh, log into a Flink container. This can be done by running this Docker Compose run Flink command. It will give us a running Pulsar cluster and a, we will now log into this Flink container. Then we'll start our Flink cluster, start cluster.sh. And then we will start a SQL client because all the dependencies of um, Pulsar SQL connector is installed already. We can just start a SQL, correct, SQL client directly. Okay, now we're inside this Blink SQL client. Let's take a look around. We'll first show current catalog. And as you can see, we're using default catalog, which is a generic in-memory catalog. But since we're demonstrating Pulsar catalog, we're not even this one. So I'm going to copy this code here to create a new Pulsar catalog. Its name will be Pulsar. And then, or oh, use catalog pulsar. Cool. Let's show current catalog again. We're now in pulsar. Then let's take a look around what's the databases here. Show databases. As you can see here, there are four existing databases. The first one is created uh, when the pulsar catalog is created. The last three we scan from the um, existing pulsar tenants and namespaces. So if we go to a pulsar uh, and use pulsar command line tool, this is called, called pulsar CTL, and we can do a namespaces uh, list. What what's the tenant name sample? Yeah, and you can see here this is a namespaces called the NS one under tenant sample. That's what we ex that is exactly the database name here. So now. For our demonstration, we need to create a new uh, namespaces. Let's create a uh, namespace create. I think it's this command. Okay, pause our CTO namespaces spaces create sample slash link. Okay, we'll create a new uh, namespace here and then we'll do the show database again. As you can see here, uh, there is a new database coming out because it's created automatically. And then we're going to create a topic. Topic is create, we'll create a topic called sample flink user with a four partition. And now it's there already. So let's first start by explicit table. Now, next thing we're gonna do, let's create a new database to use, all right? Then we can do create database uh, SQL examples. And then use database. Uh, no, no, no database. Just use SQL examples. Okay, we're inside this database. Let's see what are the tables here. Okay, there is no tables yet because we just created the database. And now we're going to create a new uh, table here. Uh, we're using the same example in the slide, which uh, as you can see here, it's SQL user. 
And once you want to mention, there is some tiny differences. As you can see within the connector configs, there is no like connection related configs such as admin URL or surface URL. This is because while you are using a Flutter catalog, you cannot, uh, you can ignore the connection uh, URLs and it, it will use the default URL coming from the uh, star catalog, which is here. So here we just, we can just uh, save a couple of lines and execute the create statement. The create statement, like there are four columns and this is a watermark strategies. And next we're going to do a window aggregation uh, query from it. As you can see here, this window aggregation query, it will group by a 10 second tumbling window and whether this user is single or not. And it will show us the single status and the uh, window start time and then calculate the sum of ages of all the users. Now let's submit this query. Uh, since this uh, uh, table is ma kind of mapped to this topic here, sample flink user, and there is no data flowing in that topic uh, now, we're going to uh, produce some uh, users into that topic. This can be done by produce user.sh. It's just going to put some random users inside Okay, as you can see here, we can wait for a couple of seconds uh, since the data, the, everything is ramping up and there is a 10 seconds window. You will only see the data uh, once the 10 seconds window is uh, done. Okay, there we have our first set of uh, data coming in, the second set of data, and you can see there's a 10 seconds interval. Okay, and we're seeing more and more data coming out of the uh, pipeline, which is very good. Okay, now we have seen this a lot. We can quit this uh, simple query. And in fact, uh, you can not only query from this um, topic, you can also insert into this table as well. Uh, for example, if we just insert one record only here, inserting the secret users using a uh, such value. Okay, let's submit this, wait for the job to complete. And then we're going to kind of like select this, um, select from the table uh, where name equals to Alice, which we just inserted into. Cool. Let's wait for a couple of seconds and wait for the job to spawn up. Okay, now we're seeing the a record popping out from uh, the window, and it means that the query has been successful. Cool, let's quit. And that's pretty much uh, the basic use of a, a an explicit table. And once we're done with it, we can uh, kind of stop this producer um, program here, and then show tables. As you can see, we have a secret user here, and we can drop it, secret user. Oh, sorry, I need to stop table secret user. Yeah, and it's done already, cool. Uh, this is ab about uh, the explicit table, but as we mentioned earlier, we can also query from a native table as well, right? So let's go to a native table and show the databases. Basis, because um, a table, uh, the topic we are reading from is in the sample flink, we are going to use this database. So use sample slash flink. Notice I'm using a, a special mark to uh, around the database name. And we can show tables here. Okay, as you can see here, this is a, a table name called user. It's uh, mapped for directly from the topic and the user. And we can actually select from this user as well. For example, uh, we can select uh, one second, select star from user. I'm going to limit 10, it's only pretty 10 records at a time. Okay, well, seeing now the, seeing the data is coming out of it. And same similarly, we can insert into this table as well. For example, if we do uh, insert into user values and let's wait for it to finish. The username is called Bob, and then we select from user 
name Bob here. Okay, cool. Let's wait for a couple of seconds and it should be coming up right about time. Okay, cool. As you can see, we have seen Bob and age and square time and income, just like we inserted. Okay, this is how we're using a native table for simple queries. But uh, unlike an explicit table, you cannot drop a, a explicit table. Uh, uh, you cannot drop a native table because it's it's a native topic and it's mapped directly from uh, parser topics. You do not have the um, authority to, or the you we do not want any flink on um, programs to have access to uh, deleting or adding new topics within the parser clusters. So that's uh, all about the native table. So, so far we have covered the explicit table and native table. This is just some very uh, basic use cases. And for more advanced uh, use cases, you can go to the Flink example repository and see if there is any cookbooks and examples uh, that suits your, 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 your foot. Okay, and that concludes our demo today. Pulsar SQL connector is far from perfect. So there is a lot of future work to do. For example, we currently don't have a corresponding Flink format for protobuf native pulsar schema. And so that means we have to implement a new Flink format that is designed specific, specifically for protobuf native pulsar schema. And the second thing I want to mention is to support a upsert mode pulsar. Upsert mode pulsar will be used for in change data capture scenarios, and it should work well with the change data capture Flink formats. But with that kind of mode, you can use pulsar and Flink together to create a full function in change data capture solution, such as creating a real time materialized view or any other use cases you can think of. The third thing is to provide more cookbook examples. So if you have a, you want to get it started quickly, you don't know how to use the Pulsar SQL, you don't know what you can do with the Pulsar SQL connectors, then you can go to our cookbook examples and look for a quick solution. On the right side are some resources I listed out. The first one is a SQL connector image. It has all the dependencies installed. You can start using it right away, like I did in the demo. It will be useful. Uh, it, it can be used for on Flink 1.15 and later versions. The second is the uh, GitHub repository. You can report issues. You can report bugs on this uh, GitHub repository. And the third, we have been using this a lot in this uh, session today is a Flink, Flink example repository. So when you get started, guys, you can just go right into this uh, Flink example and check out not only SQL examples, but also data stream examples as well. And uh, finally, is the documentation for Pulsar SQL connectors. Uh, currently, the documentation is not hosted on Flink official websites. It's hosted on our stream native um, documentation websites for now. And I think this pretty much concludes everything about today's presentation. And thank you so much for attending uh, today's session.